Okay, so if you're confused about how our cast of characters actually enter War Within, this video's for you. What happens is we drop into Khazal Gar with a tight cast of established characters. We're basically a bit of an advanced guard, an advanced strike team trying to take down Zalatath. Everyone on board has a personal mission, a big internal conflict, and a calling from the world soul. We see Thrall and Magni with their connection to Azeroth, Illyria's hunt for the void, and Anduin's journey to redemption. So today's mission is really simple. We're going to go through the key cast of characters, and I'm going to work out for you where everybody last left off so you can start the war within being in the loop. Just like I'm going to keep you in the loop with today's sponsor. Man, I get so busy and overwhelmed that I actually just fall behind in important stuff. And it means that I get those, your subscription just renewed emails that kind of sting. Well, Rocket Money solves that problem and it makes money less stressful. It's a personal finance tool that helps you lower your bills, stay on top of your subscriptions and manage your money. And you can start for free today at rocketmoney.com forward slash Ballular Warcraft. So let's talk about those subscriptions. Rocket Money will securely and safely identify recurring charges for you. When it does that, it will give you a UI to easily cancel them in just a few taps, which is pretty damn sweet. So if this has been on your to-do list, then Rocket Money can just make it easy to solve today. What about your bills? If you want them lower, but you don't want to spend your life just listening to hold music on a phone line, you can upload them and Rocket Money will help negotiate them for you. Like seriously, if your phone or broadband is like after its contract date and it's just rolling over, often you can get a way better deal. I recently just did that. And the numbers are pretty damn good. They're saving their customers up to $740 a year. They've got over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. So if you want to spend more and save less, join the over 5 million people using Rocket Money at rocketmoney.com forward slash Bellular Warcraft, or just click link down in the description. You can start for free, check it out. And if you want more features, then you can go for premium. And of course, that's rocketmoney.com forward slash Bellular Warcraft to get started. Anduin is front and center once again. He's a little broken, he doesn't really have a clear path, but for the first time in years, he actually feels some hope. His most recent arc culminated in the Shadowlands expansion, and he basically went from the head of the Alliance making brutal decisions in the Fourth War to a tool of the Jailer committing horrible acts trapped inside his own body, aware of the terrible things his body was doing. And this was summed up the last time we set eyes on him. In a vision from Dorothur, Toronto's owl left to watch Sylvanas and the Maw, we saw Anduin. Now, of course, Sylvanas had been his jailer, but now as a fellow slave to the jailer, well, she's one of the only people who could actually understand his pain. Now, even then, Sylvanas questioned why he did not return to his people. The basic answer, Anduin was traumatized and did not believe that people would accept him back. He's compounded his trauma since Varian died at the Broken Shore, uh, becoming king, sending Westfall farmers to the front line to die, failing to protect Teldrassil. So it wasn't just the Jailer, he also felt responsible for so many of the terrible events that happened while he was king. And after the Shadowlands, he went to ground with occasional reported sightings by SI7. The calling short story filled in many of the blanks for us. Anduin took the name Jarek and wandered Azeroth doing hard labor by day, drowning his sorrows by night. Anytime he settled, the visions would return, and then he would hit the road again, trying to outrun them. That is, however, until he ended up in the Stormsong Valley and started working at a mill. And while working at this mill, for the first time, he grew to love the people around him. But that is, of course, until the world soul called again, once more, he hit the road, but this time feeling a little bit more purpose. That is, of course, what leads him to the Sword and Silithus and the scene with Thrall that we see in the cinematic. So, for Anduin, he's definitely broken, he's definitely struggling, and this time it's not just a case of him finding the light and suddenly being okay. No, there's his relationship with the light. There's, of course, his kingdom where, yeah, he's their king, but he also left for ages with Turalyon being the regent, and, of course, the planet calling out to him. That does mean that while he has some hope, while there are some positive emotions there and he's going in the right direction, he does have an absolutely monumental amount of work left to do to basically pick up the pieces of his life and get back on track. We recently saw Thrall try to commune with the elements, but the harder he tried, the more they just slipped away, and that made him frustrated. Thing is, though, it's not really Thrall's fault this time. The planet is in a dire state, and her elements are out of whack. So it's not surprising, then, that Thrall is coming with us, but he's not really the frontline warrior that he was. He's 
grown a bit, he's went through a lot, he's got a unique perspective. He could be a bit of a steady hand to guide us through the madness that is about to unfold here. You see, before Sylvanas unleashed the Jailer's whole world-ending plan, she kidnapped various defenders of the world who could stop her, and as former World Shaman and one of the World Soul's top defenders, Thrall was top of that list. Now, during the Shadowlands, Thrall met Draca, well, the spirit of Draca, his mother. She had sacrificed herself to save him as a baby, and in doing so, she earned a place in Maldraxxus. She asked who he'd become, but Thrall couldn't really tell her. He wasn't a leader anymore, but he still was depended on by people. He wasn't fighting in the front lines of the Shadowlands, he was mostly a witness, so he's had a bit of a funny place in the world. Thrall reflected on his journey from the internment camps of Lordaeron years ago to freeing the orcs and giving them a home in Kalimdor. And the final step in that process was bringing back the Kosharg, which is a yearly festival where all of the orc clans, even those traditionally, uh, you know, who fight each other, where they unite and they celebrate their ancestors and look to the future. And with that being re-established, in a way Thrall has come full circle. And that means it's finally time to retire, or so one would think, because he too has got the visions. Illyria has been set up as a sort of super weapon for the Void. What happened is she absorbed the dark Naru, Lura, giving her essentially the powers of a godlike entity to call on. The problem is she can only use that power as much as she can maintain her own sanity. If she dives into it too much, she will probably just lose herself to the Void. That is where Locust Walker stepped in, essentially teaching her the fundamentals of balance, but also pointing out her one major weakness, family. Illyria fights for family. If you know her deep past, well, you know that uh, pretty profoundly. And that means she's willing to sacrifice just about anything for them. So to Locust Walker, that is a massive, massive risk. And we actually saw some of that risk play out in the Darkheart patch. The thing that Locust Walker maybe doesn't understand is that Turalyon and Arator may actually be the only things keeping her sane, her one connection to reality that is not messed up by Void. Now, after the Legion expansion, Illyria dropped out of the story while all of the old god gambits were playing out. She was clearly not Nazoth's tool to use, but one of his servants, Ilganoth, said this, At the hour of her third death, she will usher in our coming. And curiously, Illyria herself said that she had felt like she's died twice already, once on Draenor and once again when she absorbed Lura. After which, Zalatath said, the caterpillar has become the butterfly, she's all but ours now. Which certainly is a little bit suspicious. I mean, seriously, that is the Void essentially saying that they are going to corrupt her and she pretty much is theirs. And so we saw some of that in Dragonflight's final patch where Illyria hunted down Zalatath, but just ended up in a trap specifically designed to point out her weaknesses regarding her family. And so that is essentially the situation. Illyria wants to do anything that she can to protect her family, the big question is, she is on a knife edge, and will she actually push so far to save her family that she ends up losing them and everything that makes her who she is? Zalatath. Outside of messing with Illyria and Darkheart, Zalatath's presence has been slowly building in the franchise. She double-dealed her way to freedom in battle for Azeroth and then disappeared through a void portal. Of course, we knew she would return, but it did take a little bit of time to connect the dots. Naga prophecies washed up in the Forbidden Shore, claiming the void had a harbinger who would usher in Ashara's coming. Then, Eridacron, the seemingly big antagonist of Dragonflight, actually revealed that he was working with the harbinger, giving us this silhouetted shot that was all but confirmed to be Zalatath. Then, over in classic Season of Discovery, a shadowy figure with some of the same motivations and dress sense as Zalatath had been making moves. She offers what we think is powerful gear for apparently trivial items. Uh, there's a simple box hidden away in Black Fathom, a small part of the dream used to create the Emerald Nightmare. A lot of strange things. And in Dragonflight, Zalatath was also seen collecting things like, of course, the Dark Heart artifact and Galakron's essence. And in the War Within, we see her collecting the blood of old gods. So either she has a plan for all of this stuff, or she's just slurping up all these artifacts to maximize her power. But there is another angle to this. Through the staff Void Song, we found out that she was actually the harbinger of Dementius, who is a Void Lord. And worse, we learned that the ethereal homeworld of Koresh actually had a world soul, a world soul that sang a radiant song, just like Azeroth is singing, 
just before Dementia showed up and essentially consumed the world. So the stakes are pretty high. And of course, whatever happens next, Zalatath will need servants, and that is what seems to bring her to Ajkahet over the last few years. She's elevated Ansarak to the throne and began mutating the Rubians using the blood of old gods, creating the Ascended. Ashkahet is now a very, very powerful kingdom. Question is, what does Zalatath get in return? We're not exactly sure, but at the very least, she does have an army to do it with. Following Legion, Khadgar managed to wrestle Dalaran out of faction politics and essentially just make it a planetary defense platform where mage things would happen. So, when the Fourth War kicked off, he returned to Dalaran in disgust, and from the top, he occasionally glimpsed beyond the Vale to the Shadowlands, and at the tail end of that expansion, he showed up in Oribos, looking a little bit uneasy. He said that he wanted to visit the Shadowlands before something happened. He didn't really say what, but... It's Khadgar investigating things, so obviously there's gravity to it. Or it could even be more simple that he wants to visit the Shadowlands before he dies. Khadgar, you see, has seen his own death. It was on a planet with a red sky surrounded by orcs. Now that's odd because we are certainly a long way away from Outland, but something is in the water, something's going on with him. Once again at the forefront in Dragonflight, he worked alongside Caligos in the Azure Span, and then he helped us into the Vault of the Incarnates. Then, though, as the cosmic mystery unfolded, he was, like his once master Medivh, the first person to point out that something terrible was about to happen. So he did what he could to learn about the Harbinger, and he sent his best Void Hunter to investigate, as we saw in the Dark Heart patch. As for what next, well, we're going to need a ride to Khazalgar, and Khadgar has been inviting the best and the brightest to the city of Dalaran. Kazalgar is an absolute masterpiece of Dwarven and Titan lore. You've got the hill earthen homes that look straight out of Loch Modan too, down in the ringing deeps, all of this crazy true Dwarven industry. I mean, hell, almost half the characters in this video are Dwarves, so let's begin with the Bronzebeards. Bran Bronzebeard, the youngest of the brothers, is an archaeologist with a thirst for danger and a love of guns, and since the earliest days of Warcraft, he has been at the forefront of Titan lore. He's explored Ulduar, he's taught us about all the histories of the Earth, and, and even as recently as Battle for Azeroth, he's been involved when we got to Nazmir and found even more Titan experiments going wrong. Bran was there to tell us that Gahoon was essentially made from the spare parts of old gods. He does one important thing, basically. He explores new, dangerous places, and that makes him our perfect partner for the new Delves feature. On the other hand, though, Magni Bronzebeard is not looking so hot. He was our resident Azeroth expert during BFA, you know, the wounds. He turned himself into Diamond in order to speak with her, and after Sargaris attacked, he called us to the Chamber of the Heart. Throughout BFA, he was our guy, explaining every quirk of Titan technology or just who we needed to kill to get the job done. And you'd think with BFA over, Azeroth was no longer in mortal danger. But then, at the end of Shadowlands, he told us that she was singing a new song, one of hope and healing. Every time our world soul is called out, Magni has been there to hear her. So that means he's obviously the first person we're going to talk to to kick off this world soul saga, right? Well, not really, because as of pre-patch, Azeroth isn't speaking to Magni anymore, and he needs to start thinking about who he is without Azeroth. The Thorissians, okay, Magni Bronzebeard may have been once King of the Dwarves, but the future King of the Dwarves is actually a Dark Iron called Dagran Thorassian II. And while some players will know him, not everybody will, so let's do the story. Dagran II's father, Dagran I, kidnapped Moira Bronzebeard, Magni's daughter. But the weird thing is they um, actually ended up falling in love and having a child. That child is Dagran II. Now, they didn't really get much time to celebrate all of this because we busted into Shadowforge City and we killed Dagran. When that happened, Moira refused to leave with us, and she became the Queen Regent of Shadowforge, and she basically continued the war with the Bronzebeards. Now, Magni said that he would never recognize Dagran II as his nephew, let alone as rightful heir to both Bronzebeard and Dark Iron Lands. But after Magni was turned to Diamond, Moira pushed Dagran II's claim to the throne and invaded Ironforge. She ended up kidnapping Anduin, leading Varian on a bloody rampage that nearly ended with him executing Moira. What happened though was thankfully not as bloody. Anduin ended up hammering out a compromise here, and that compromise is the Council of the Three Hammers. So here's what Moira got. When Dagran II comes of age, he will be king of all of the dwarves, Bronzebeards, 
Dark Irons, and Wild Hammer. And up until that point, the Council of the Three Hammers will rule. So, with that, Moira re-established the Dark Irons. She brought them into the Alliance and used their once connection to the Twilight's Hammer to infiltrate the cult and keep tabs on the Void. And all of this, of course, is in pursuit of Dagram II's ascension to King, where he won't just be King of the Bronzebeards. No, he will be basically King of all Dwarves, an extremely powerful position. Now, that's all well and good, but Dagram is also just a person. And he's actually not as ambitious as his father was. He's not as determined as his mother. He enjoys books, archaeology, research. He basically doesn't see himself as a warrior king. And I've got to imagine of anybody, he'd probably get along with Bran the best because they like researching things and archaeology. But regardless of who he is, he is set to become King of the Dwarves and he will be joining us on this adventure. And so that's basically it. You're now caught up with the key cast of characters who will be following us into this expansion. Now you might be looking at all these people and saying, hang on a second, where's the Horde? Blizzard, I think, are actually aware of that, and it very much does seem that the next expansion, Midnight, will have a little bit more of a Horde focus. Now, there's obvious ways in which Midnight will have Alliance characters, given that it is happening, you know, up north in the Eastern Kingdoms, but obviously, you've got the Blood Elves, uh, you've got the Undead, loads of Horde-related things there. And, of course, there is Thrall for now. The thing is, it doesn't really seem the Thrall is massively active in the opening thrust of this expansion. So I think that does mean the Blizzard are probably bringing him here with some sort of intention to do something a bit bigger with him in the future. But anyway, if you've been a little bit confused about where all of these characters have been or who they even are, well, I hope this video has helped you. And if you want to check out some more lore to help you get ready, how about this, which is a recap of the Dragonflight expansion so you know exactly where, plot-wise, we left off. Thank you.